What's Shake and Fire Nation? JLD here with an audio masterclass on strategically positioning your company for sale in seven steps. To drop the value bombs here, I have brought Terry Lammers. He's a certified valuation analyst and co-founder of Innovative Business Advisors. He works with his team to guide current business owners looking to sell their enterprises as well as prospective buyers. His new book, You Don't Know What You Don't Know, is an in-depth examination of the process of buying, growing, and eventually selling a business. So Fire Nation, we're going to go through those seven steps today as soon as we get back from thinking our sponsors. In the beginning stages of your business, you may have custom corners to save money. I get it. But now you have a real business and it's time you had an attorney by your side. Visit bizcouncil.com slash fire to get your first month free. That's bizcouncil.com slash fire. Last Cyber Weekend, Clavio helped generate more than $100 million in sales for innovative direct-to-consumer brands like yours. Now, they're sharing their insights with you. From segment targeting criteria to sample marketing campaigns you can run, Clavio's go-to guide is your destination for peak holiday revenue. Download yours today at Clavio.com slash fire. Terry, say what's up to Fire Nation and share something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. All right. Well, hey, what's up, Fire Nation? I thought it would be very appropriate that most people probably don't know that I was a volunteer firefighter for 22 years and I'm retired from that, but I'm still president of our district. Well, thank you for your service, Terry. That definitely means a lot. Being a military veteran myself, I always love people that have served in any way, shape, or form. And Fire Nation, as you know, we're talking about strategically positioning your company for sale in seven steps. And I just love a step-by-step process. That's how I create my courses, my products, my services. So Terry, you are speaking my language, brother. Let's dive in with step one, which is identifying the critical factors that determine a company's worth. What is that and how do we do that? The biggest driver of value in a company is its cash flow. And, you know, you get a couple steps down there further. We'll talk about, you know, it's not about sales. It's not about net income. It's about the gross profit and cash flow of the company. You need to get down to the true cash flow of the company. Um, net income has some hidden things in it, like depreciation. You may have uh, personal expenses on your income statement. But really getting to the true cash flow of the company is what's going to drive a large part of the value of the company. So if you were to approach a company and you didn't know anything about them and they wanted you to determine their worth, what would be the process you would go through to do just that? You know, when we do valuations, the first thing we do is get three to five years worth of financial statements and or tax returns. And uh, we'll put that into an income trend, meaning, you know, like 15, 16, 17, 18, and, and go straight down. And then when you get to the bottom to the income, we go through and we ask the owner a bunch of questions because there's certain addbacks that we do to get to the true value of the company, like adding back uh, uh, depreciation and amortization. Those are non-cash at, uh, expenses. Adding back interest expense, because if you're going to buy the company, you're going to have your own interest expense. Normalizing certain expenses like owner salary. Sometimes you see where the owner's not paying himself anything, and we want to put you know, a normal salary into that, into that cash flow, or even rent sometimes but if they own real estate and they're not, they're either paying themselves, you know, too much rent that's coming out of the company or not enough rent at all. We need to put a fair market value rent in there. Also, when you get to that, when you get to that cash flow, then down at the bottom, you know, what we're going to be looking at, what's, what's the trend line doing? Are they making about the same every year where maybe we use an average um, or is it a good situation where the, the income's going up? Maybe they made 300000 this, you know, three years ago, 400 and 500 Or is it an unfortunate, unfortunate situation, what we call the glider path, where the owner kind of took his foot off the gas five years ago and the income's just been slightly coming down year after year after year? So if the income's going straight up, you know, do you value the future cash flows of the company? Or if it is on that glider path down, are you, you know, you valuing it just on the last year? Or are you even going to value it lower than what the last year's cash flow was? That's usually a great starting point. 
Don't be on a glider path, Fire Nation. You want to be on that upward trajectory. And just real quick, before we move on to step two, what are some of the best practices that you've seen companies implement that can really improve their overall worth? Right out of the gate with your financial statements, you need to be on accrual accounting. If you're going to buy a company and they're using cash accounting, that's a red flag. Buyer beware. There's too many ways you can manipulate the financial statements using cash accounting. Accrual accounting is much more accurate. Uh, it's going to give you an I, you know, it, without without accrual accounting, you don't have accounts receivable or accounts payable. So, what kind of outstanding receivables do they have? Are their customers paying on time? You know, likewise, do they have any? You know, what's their accounts payables out there? Things like that. That's that's a that's a big one right out of the gate. Accrual accounting, Fire Nation. If you don't know what that is, make sure you're talking to your CPA, to your legal team. This is a step in the process to getting your company's net worth where it needs to be. John, then the second thing I would say is having having readable financial statements. I get it two ways where I get one page and it's like, here's my income, here's my gross profit, here's my expense, one you know, one expense, and then net income. The flip side of that is when you get an income statement that's eight pages long. That's too long. It, you know, people get complacent with their financial statements. And sometimes so do CPAs. So it's important to make sure that you have very readable financial statements that um, are summarized but still give plenty of detail. Let's talk about step two, finding the right attorney to both handle the deal and then the right bank for your specific needs. So you need both the right attorney and the right bank. Talk about that. It's so important to have the right attorney and the right bank. Um, talking about attorneys, you make sure you get an attorney that has done, you know, transactions before. Uh, where I see people where things really go south is they come into an M&A transaction with an estate planning attorney or somebody who's never done it before. And they can really rack up the legal expenses quickly for by fighting for things that don't really aren't necessary in the deal. I'd like to use an example. We bought a company, uh, personally bought a company. It was a Uh, property management company. And we had two terrible attorneys. They didn't like each other. They fought with each other the whole time, which ended up costing us tons of money. But we was buying a property management company and we spent the whole day arguing about um, hazardous materials. There's no hazardous materials with a property management company. Why are we even talking about this? So it's it's important that you get an attorney that's going to work with you, know what battles to fight and know when to leave something go. Banking. Banking's interesting. Big banks, little banks, banks, everybody looks at a bank that they're all the same. They're not. Uh, Big banks have their purpose. And if it's a very large transaction, you may need a bigger bank. Uh, But in general, if you're selling a company under a million dollars, it's probably easier to go to your small community bank. But if it's a deal that you're going to need an SBA loan, go to a bank that's familiar with doing SBA loans. Uh, if you don't, you know, you can go to a bank and say, yeah, we will do an SBA loan, but they haven't done one in two years and it can really bog up the process. Um, another interesting thing, interesting about banks is not all banks like to lend on the same things. Uh, after I sold the oil company, I worked for a large, a big bank, probably one of the top 10 in the United States, and they had a moratorium on construction loans. That means they wasn't going to loan to a construction company, period. So you could be the most profitable construction company out there and it's just they're not going to make loans to it however they love to making loans to doctors if you was a doctor they'd lend you a half a million dollars without looking at your balance sheet you know so different banks like different things some like non unoccupied real estate you know some don't like oil companies because there may be a hazardous material to them some don't like restaurants so when it's important that when you go to a bank pick a bank that's comfortable uh with the industry that you're looking at Now let's move into step three, and the reality is financial advisors kind of gotten a tough rap over the years. I mean, as with every profession, there are great financial advisors, and there are not so great financial advisors. So first off, how does a company know when they actually need a financial advisor, and then once they said, yes, we do need one, how do they choose the right one? You know, on this one, John, I typically look at the individual, uh, maybe so more than the company, but... uh, the two, probably the biggest divider is going to be, do you have investable assets of less than a million dollars and specifically less than say a couple hundred thousand dollars, or do you have an investable assets greater than a million dollars? If you have 
investable assets greater than a million dollars, you're really going to be looking for an RI uh, registered investment agent. And and what the biggest difference is with them is they're earning a fee off of the total amount of your portfolio. So it's in their best interest to be a fiduciary to you, meaning take you and your be- in their best interest and grow your portfolio. And they're not the most important thing to remember is they're not going to sell you products. What people really get wrapped up in when they have, a you know, say a hundred thousand dollars of investable income is there's a lot of instances where you're getting sold financial products. And that means that the financial advisor that you're working with may not have you in their best interest, but they're earning a commission on what they're selling you. That's the really the biggest difference. And entrepreneurs that are selling their business, I was a classic example. When I sold my business, I probably had less than, you know, $100,000 in investable assets. And I was not with an RIA. And after selling the company, you know, all of a sudden you have seven figures to invest. And it's important to make that jump from, you know, to a somebody that's going to have your fiduciary interest in mind. So step four can be a little counterintuitive because, you know, you would think that non-financial things wouldn't really affect the value of your company, but that's not really the case. So talk about the non-financial things that we need to be aware of that really could affect the overall value of our companies. You know, this is very important. We've had some companies that we've tried to sell that oh, I had one recently that, you know, had over a half a million dollars in cash flow and we just couldn't sell it. And uh, the reason for that was because the owner did everything. Uh, this happened to be a trucking and logistics company and he dispatched the trucks. Uh, all the employees reported to him. Um, the All the customers came to him. He did everything. If you take him out of the picture, it, it, the company doesn't run. And that's a problem. So you, you really want to get to where your company will run without yourself. Uh, we use, if you go to our website, you can take a free uh, questionnaire for the value builder system. And the value builder system is really about eight non-financial things that can affect the value of the company. Uh, another one is the Switzerland structure in the value builder system, which talks about, you know, so Switzerland was a very independent company or independent country. I'm sorry. But, so, but is your company independent of any one customer, any one employee or any one supplier? I used to have a customer with the, with the oil company. Uh, it was about a, it was a trucking company, about a 50 truck operation. So, I mean, this was a pretty large pretty large company. Yeah. Uh, and he hauled all of the milk out of a local dairy. But guess how many customers he had? One. Ooh. So if that customer leaves, the company's done. That's it. And, and you can find similar situations with, you know, suppliers. Maybe you have a contract with that supplier and that contract's not transferable to a new owner. Uh, though that's a problem. So there's hidden things that that property management company I talked about, we ended up having to do a stock sale because there was over 400 contracts to manage the properties and there wasn't a transfer clause in the contract. So we would have had to renegotiate all those contracts. So there's, you know, that's, that's something that should have been addressed well before that person wanted to sell that company. Fire Nation, it is going to matter the number of revenue streams that you have, how risky your current business model is. All of these things are going to be factored in and you need to go through these steps one by one by one to be sure that you are as prepared as possible. In Fire Nation, we are still going to be talking about steps five, six, and seven as soon as we get back from thanking our sponsors. Clavio's mission is simple, help brands grow. And they have a proven track record, especially when it comes to the busiest online shopping days of the year, Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Last Cyber Weekend, Clavio helped generate more than $100 million in sales for innovative direct-to-consumer brands like yours. What's the secret to this success? And how are today's top online brands preparing to set new records this holiday season? That's simple. Personalized marketing experiences. Experiences that create authentic relationships with your customers, and show you understand them and their preferences. In order to have a successful Black Friday and Cyber Monday, you must understand your customer, their purchase motivations, and what kind of marketing messages they should receive. The more you can own the customer experience, the more successful you'll be. And lucky for us, Clavio helps the most innovative online businesses own their growth. To help you, Clavio has released a holiday planning go-to guide. Get the guide and maximize your fourth quarter sales by visiting clavio.com slash fire. 
fire. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash fire. In the beginning stages of your business, you may have cut some corners to save money. I get it. But now you have a real business, something to protect, and it's time you had an attorney by your side. Enter Biz Counsel. Biz Counsel provides you with your own dedicated business attorney for a fraction of what it would normally cost. Biz Counsel comes from the same guys who started LegalZoom, and now they're changing the way small business owners access lawyers without breaking the bank. Here's how Biz Counsel works. For just $89 a month, you get a dedicated attorney you can talk to at any time. That means if you have a question today, tomorrow, or next month, you can just pick up the phone and get answers from someone you trust. You can also get contracts reviewed for for free. And if you need something drafted from scratch, your attorney can help you at a discounted rate. In a nutshell, Biz Counsel handles the legal stuff so you can focus on your successes. Visit bizcounsel.com slash fire to get your first month free. That's a dedicated business attorney waiting for you at bizcounsel.com slash fire. So Terry, let's talk about step five. And you mentioned it a couple times prior, but now we're really going to do a deep dive on focusing on profit and cash flow. We're not talking sales and net income. So break that down for us. That's probably the biggest thing that I have people come to me all the time. It's like, man, my sales are up a half a million dollars this year. And I feel bad when I tell them, who cares if your sales are up, but you don't make the same gross margin and your gross profit didn't go up, it doesn't matter that your sales went up. You didn't generate any gross profit from from what you sold. In fact, you might have just generated more work for yourself. Exactly. And that happens a lot when people are getting, you know, as they grow their companies, you know, I got this big customer and I gave him a deal. And then I got a bigger customer and I gave him a bigger deal. Well, the next thing you know, you're hiring employees and doing all this and 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 you're just you're just cutting your legs off from, you know, underneath you. Yeah. So you know, the next but the next biggest thing is gross profit and then net income. If you're looking at the net income, especially in today's environment with bonus depreciation, you know, if you bought a large piece of equipment, they may have wrote off $250,000 in depreciation. Well, that's going to have a significant effect on your net income. But you have to remember that gets added back into net income and to get to the true cash flow of your company. And, you know, this was really something that was kind of an aha moment for me because I had a business coach when I owned the oil company and they taught us about getting to EBITDA, you know, earnings before interest, depreciation, taxes, and, you know, whatever. earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, you know, EBITDA, EBITDA. <laughs> yeah, it's the first time I've heard that word. Uh, it, but anyway, you know, it was always, and I was a pretty large company, so we had a ton of depreciation and it always frustrated me as a business owner. It's like, man, if we didn't have to have depreciation, I'd be making a heck of a lot of money. Yeah. And then you get taught that, you know, Hey, that's a non, cash expense and it gets added back. But in the back of your mind, it was always like, well, but what's the bank looking at? You know, are they, are they, are they looking at net income or are they really looking at the true cash flow of the company? So that's what was kind of neat about going to work for a bank after I sold the oil company is that you bet your life they're work, they're looking at cash flow. So that's very important. And I have people come to me with their financial statements, you know, and their heads kind of down and they shove it across the table to you and they've lost money. But They've lost money because they have a large depreciation expense. You start adding that back in and they perk up a little bit and it's like, well, well maybe, they ain't, maybe we ain't doing so bad after all. Focus on profit and cash flow fire nation, not sales and net income. You need to think about this when you are going through the process of what you are really looking at and measuring. Now, step number six, this is kind of interesting because so many people are so focused on the prize. They're just so focused on the sale if they're working towards that that they don't develop a life plan for after the sale. And Terry, you've probably seen this, so let's talk about it. Like, what's the process there? I've seen this personally, and it hits you like a truck. Uh, The last chapter in my book is don't be like the dog that caught the car. In other words, have a plan for your life when you sell your company. (laughs) I I was, I was literally only 40 years old when I sold the company and you're right. I was totally wrapped into it. It was always my plan to grow the company and sell it. I've bought 11 companies and I grew it and, and uh, I've had somebody value it. And I said, you know what, if we can sell it for that, let's sell it. Sold it. Had to work for that company for six months and and then all of a sudden it gets really quiet because your phone's not ringing anymore. You're used to going 100 miles an hour and 100 people coming to you in a day. And now you look at your phone. It doesn't it's not ringing. Um, 
every, everybody's gone, your employees, your customers, you're thinking, this is great. This is what I've been living for. You know, I'm going to hunt, fish, and golf the rest of my life. Well, after about a month of that, all your friends are working yet, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, boy. And then my wife's telling me, um, you need to get a job. You're get not hanging out around the, the house. house. <laughs> So uh, it is important and it doesn't matter if you're 40 or if you're 70, you know, you need to have a plan. What are you going to do? You, it is, it is really very important to think that through. Fire Nation, develop a life plan for after the sale. Now, step seven, the grand finale, ask questions because you don't know what you don't know, which happens to be a pretty good lead into a book that I might've heard of. It's always a bucket list item of mine <laughs> to write a book. And I love the saying, you don't know what you don't know. Um, the, the byline is everything you need to know to buy or sell a business. But, you know, in the book, I talk about things that I did right and things that I should have done differently. And I, I can't have any regrets about selling my company. But there was truly a lot of things that I didn't know. And you, and you don't know the right questions to ask. So that's why, you know, I'm not coming on the show to say, use a business broker, but go to somebody who's been through some transactions before, because you've got to ask the right questions, whether you're selling a company or whether you're buying a company. Um, you know, if you're buying the company, what's the right due diligence questions I should ask? If you're selling the company, you know, what's the steps that I need to take before I bring this thing to market that's really going to get get me true value, you know, uh, the best value for the company. And a lot of times it's just the littlest things. But if nobody's told you it, you don't know. So um, don't hesitate to ask questions. And I'm sure a lot of people out there would be exactly like how I was. You know, you're you're going through the process of selling your company. God forbid you don't want anybody to know about it. Right. Um, but it, it is you need to seek out the right advice. And I run into people all the time. I had a gentleman uh, a couple of weeks ago in my office. I valued his company at over $14 million. And he says, I don't need any help to do this. I look at contracts all day long. And while he's sitting in my office, I told him two or three things that are going to help save him hundreds of thousands of dollars. And every time you would catch him kind of going, oh, yeah, OK, I'll think. Uh, yeah, I got that. <laughs> it's like, what, you know. There's a hundred more we got to go through. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. And, you know, on a transaction that large, large, you're, you're talking about some real money. But it, but it's real money. It doesn't matter, you know, if you need a million dollars to make it to your retirement plan or, or 10 million. You, you know, there's a there is a process to go through. And just like I, you know, I wouldn't take somebody's gallbladder out. I wouldn't change an engine out of a truck. But, you know, there are people that do that. There's people that can help you through the process of buying or selling a business. But what if you stayed in a holiday in the night before? Would you do the those things Holiday Express, then? right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I love that expression. I've used that before. <laughs> oh, so Terry, you dropped a lot of value bombs, brother. You've walked us through these seven steps. Give us the one overall big takeaway that you want to make sure our listeners really get. Then let us know how we can find out more about you. Give us a call to action about where we can find your book. And then we'll say goodbye. You know, I've thought about that. You know, you've obviously given me these questions at the times. Like, what's that one big thing? And the only thing I could think of was the movie where, oh, shoot, I forget the name. What's the, you know, he's holding up his finger. He's going, what's that one big thing? And it's like, <laughs> you know, I think the big thing is you don't know what you don't know. You have to ask questions. Everybody's situation is different. You know, the – and so the book is about mergers and acquisitions. I start off talking about buying companies and why it may make sense to buy an existing company you know, as a strategic acquisition or, you know, versus company, starting a company from scratch, which can be difficult. Or maybe a franchise is right for you. Uh, then there's a simple then there's a chapter on a simple way to value the company and get, you know, looking at somebody's financial statements and getting to that true cash flow. Uh, then we get into the process of buying a company. What's the steps? The, the middle of the book is about building. Building your team. And I'm, I'm a big believer in building a team. And that's why I think it's hard to say there's one person. But, you know, who's your banker? Who's your attorney? Who's your financial advisor? Who's your CPA? You know, is there somebody else you need? Make sure you have a team of people helping you with the transaction. Um, after that, we get in the book and talk about bankability. Are you a bankable person? You know, do you, if you're going to go buy a company, do your company or you even have your stuff together to know that you're a bankable person? So we talk about being bankable. And, you know, basically there's two sides to every loan cash flow and collateral. Then we get into building value in the company, and uh, that's kind of where the eight value drivers of the value builder system come into play. And and then um, 
from there we get into confidentiality and the process of selling the business. And, you know, the last, the last chapter then is about, um, have you know, don't be like the dog that caught the car, have a plan for your life after you sell your business. It's very important. So, uh, the book is available on Amazon. You can find me on LinkedIn. Our website is www.innovative with two ends, innovative B a boy, apple.com. There's a ton of information out there. I'd invite you to go to the website. Uh, you can click on the media button and see several articles and other podcasts that I've been on. There's three free questionnaires that you can take the value builder, Uh, system questionnaire. Uh, There's another one called Biz Equity, which is a free kind of a 10,000 foot view value free valuation tool that you can use. And the other one, the the name is escaping me off the top of my head, but it's basically um, a questionnaire that's asking you, are you ready to exit? You know, do you have a plan? How much time do you spend in in your business? Um, It's a it's a good tool to to start with. So those are all free on our website, along with a ton of other information. Fire Nation, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and you have been hanging out with TL and JLD today. So keep up the heat and head over to eofire.com. Type Terry in the search bar and his show notes page will pop up with everything that we've been talking about today best show notes in the biz. And of course, you want to check out his book, You Don't Know What You Don't Know. It's an in-depth examination of the process of buying, growing, and eventually selling a business. Terry, thank you for sharing your truth with Fire Nation today. For that, we salute you, brother, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you, sir. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Fire Nation. Today's value bomb content was brought to you by Terry and Successful Entrepreneurs. They accomplish big goals. I mean, huge goals. That's why I created the Freedom Journal to guide you, Fire Nation, in accomplishing your number one goal in 100 days. And I'm talking step by step, step by step, day by day. Anyways, visit thefreedomjournal.com, use promo code podcast, and I'll get you $15 off Fire Nation as a thank you for listening to my podcast. I'll catch you there or I'll catch you on the flip side. In the beginning stages of your business, you may have custom corners to save money. I get it. But now you have a real business and it's time you had an attorney by your side. Visit bizcouncil.com slash fire to get your first month free. That's B-I-Z com slash fire. Last Cyber Weekend, Clavio helped generate more than $100 million in sales for innovative direct-to-consumer brands like yours. Now, they're sharing their insights with you. From segment targeting criteria to sample marketing campaigns you can run, Clavio's go-to guide is your destination for peak holiday revenue. Download yours today at clavio.com slash fire.